Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro. I'm a former president of the North American Menopause Society and on the board of trustees of NAMS, and I am delighted to be here today with Dr. Cynthia Stunkel. Firstly, tell everybody what you do. I'm an endocrinologist and an internist, and I teach at the medical school at UCSD. I attend on our uh, endocrine uh, clinics, and I teach our early medical students to help shape their minds. Okay, <laughs> so this is a very confusing topic for healthcare providers, aspirin, because it seems that over the course of time, guidelines have changed, recommendations have changed, and, and I think that a lot of healthcare providers are very confused. So let's talk about, should everybody be taking aspirin? Does aspirin reduce heart and stroke? What's the word? I think it's important to begin at the beginning and just remind everyone why we use aspirin or how aspirin works. Yes. And it interferes with the cyclooxygenase uh, production, which has two effects. The good effect to reduce heart attack and stroke is inhibiting the production of thromboxin A2. This works to prevent, or the thromboxin A2 is a potent vasoconstrictor and promotes platelet aggregation. So by inhibiting that, that's really a good thing. The downside is that it also inhibits the production of prostaglandins, which can be protective at the level of the gut, particularly against bleeding. So on the one hand, we have the risk uh, of clotting that we want to inhibit. On the other hand, we have to face the risk of bleeding which is, makes it complicated. And that's really the central dilemma when we try to sort this out. So for the longest time, primary prevention, meaning people who hadn't had a cardiac right. event, everybody was popping acetosilic acid, ASA, 81 milligrams every day. Is that what we should be doing? Well, the reason we did that was because we had excellent trial data primarily and initially in men. men yes. And then, but we also had some very interesting data in women that was one of the first large clinical trials that said to us, we need to think differently about men and women, that this sex difference thing really counts. And the finding was that in women over the age of 50 that there was a reduction of stroke, not heart attack, which was the complete opposite that had been shown in the British a uh, doctor's study or the U.S. physician's study, all in men, but only in women after 65 was there a benefit. And so those have kind of been the levels that the American Heart in 2011 said, uh, go ahead and recommend uh, aspirin in women over 50 who have increased stroke risk or over age 65 for both. What's happened is that there have been a number of new studies as well as an analysis by the Preventive Services Task Force that are leading to a shift in our thinking about the use of aspirin. And where is that shift going now? In my bottom line view, okay. the question is, you know, who should be getting aspirin? And that's what you've been asking me. Yes. So number one, uh, there is no question that aspirin is still recommended for secondary cardiovascular right. prevention. Regardless so, of age. So your patients who've had a heart attack or a stroke, unless they have a contraindication, should be prescribed aspirin. Those guidelines have not shifted. But what's now getting even a little soft are patients with diabetes. And the American Diabetes Association, as early as January 2018, said for patients over 50, with diabetes who have at least one other cardiovascular risk factor that um, they could be offered aspirin for primary prevention. But there's been a new trial now that has looked at patients with diabetes, and for those who turned out not to have additional cardiovascular risk factors, there wasn't an impressive benefit. So even in our diabetes patients, we're going to be uh, trying to individualize that a little bit more. And finally, for patients who are absolutely, uh, don't meet the criteria that the Preventive Services Task Force uh, recommended, which was for uh, men and women over 50 with a cardiovascular risk score, the ACC, AHA risk calculator, of at least 10 or more, that those patients could be given aspirin. But even the 60-year-olds with an elevated risk, it was individualized, and they said they didn't have adequate data to make a strong recommendation for patients younger than 50 or older than 70. So it really brings it much more into question uh, than it had been in the past. 
So if we want to give our healthcare practitioners sort of some simple guidelines mm -hmm. in terms of who should, so secondary prevention right. regardless for, of age. For just about everybody else, I would recommend looking at the aspirin guide. This is an online tool like our Menno Pro app mm -hmm. that was developed by Joanne Manson uh, at Harvard with her technology team. And it's the same kind of thing. You put in the ACCAHA risks, and then there's a number of questions about bleeding risk. Right. And uh, it's very closely followed the Preventive Services Task Force recommendation, so it's not going to recommend aspirin to anyone who doesn't have at least a 10% risk. But I think it really helps sort out balancing that bleeding risk because that's really the challenge. Um, I think people go, what's changed? Aspirin hasn't changed. It's the same right. formula same that it's been forever. But the theory is that um, our overall medical approach has changed. Right. So more people are on antihypertensives now. More people are taking statins now. And maybe the baseline risk is less than it was in those trials from decades past where such a clear benefit for primary prevention mm -hmm. was shown. So um, I have on good authority that the powers that be are going to be coming out with some new primary prevention recommendations very soon. Uh, right. And so I would proceed with caution, use the aspirin guide, and uh, stay tuned. I think old habits die hard. Yes. And I think that's what's so important to realize that medicine does evolve as our information evolves. And as you say, stay tuned. Thank you so much for being with us.